for inviting me. I'd like to share with you one of my obsessions, which is the so-called personalized medicine. And uh, here in this area, where you want a computer to do the job of taking your genome and uh, suggesting a molecule, there are really no barriers here in terms of information technology, biology, chemistry, math, physics. How do they all integrate? I think I'll try to share with you and probably get you excited on some very small things you know, where you know, we, the whole world is stuck and maybe you have a bright idea. So that's where I'll try to you know, emphasize. So as we go along, how do proteins talk and why do we care? Or do you have to care for these proteins and uh, for that? So what I'm showing here on the left side is the genome. And uh, from genome to a small piece of DNA, from DNA to messenger RNA, and then to a, a tertiary structure, a protein, and eventually a drug molecule. Now, what is the idea? Suppose you know, we discover a new bug or a new pathogen, somehow that's bothering the life form. It could be human or animal, plant, etc. What What can a computer do to this? Well, the computer probably has stored all the information of the host and then we're focusing on this new bug and pathogen, starts to find out which of these little pieces of the DNA are unique to this organism that is, that's bothering this life form and start detecting them and then find out, well, maybe this is a good drug target. Just stop that or stop that from expressing itself. This, for example, you might stop the DNA or you might stop the protein making it dysfunctional so that the organism doesn't survive and then the organism is gone, the threat has disappeared and everybody is happy. So that's where I think this, this whole endeavor is going. In fact, what I envision down the line, probably some of you will contribute richly to this revolution of personalized medicine, is that you're going to stand before something like a weighing machine, put your genome card, punch in some symptoms, and then the supercomputer will take care of all the necessary calculations and eventually say, well, this is the molecule that you got to do Probably an expert system will handle it and transmit it to a medicinal chemist. They will synthesize it and get it back to you by the end of the day. Morning you say, this is my problem. It could be cancer, it could be any complicated disease, but still by the end of the day I demand there be a solution to the problem. That is conceivable and it's happening and there are several stumbling blocks, several uh, bottlenecks as we go along in this pathway. What could they be? I'll try to give you some flavor of what are the problems you will be surprised that there are some scientific problems, biological problems, but more importantly, there seems to be a problem of respect. Uh, we are stuck with our own concept of respect for the existing body of knowledge that we are unable to break these barriers of conventional wisdom. I'll try to emphasize on with a couple of examples. Now, to move forward, this is the, the team that's making it possible at IIT, putting it all together from the genome all the way to a drug molecule, the software, the methodologies, the science, and the technology and uh, several smart minds. We have a six teraflop machine. Hopefully it will go to 100 teraflops very soon. And uh, those are the various people who are contributing, including Pragya from NSIT. Then a uh, couple of my, uh, some of my students formed a startup company. They said, well, this software is worth making some money out for new molecule discovery. So the lead in people are a batch of uh, four people from my laboratory. They created a startup start startup company. It was incubated at IIT and in about three years of time, I understand they received a Biospectrum Award as the fastest growing company in Pacific Asia, Pacific region. I'm very proud of these young boys. And inspired by them, a few more students have joined and they started a NOVA Informatics type of company. So it looks like there is some money involved in this, this software development for drug discovery. So then comes the acknowledgments who made it possible. And now back to the central dogma of life. You know, some of you probably are not doing this genome, proteome, etc., on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, what it's all about is that we all have several cells in the body, and each cell has the entire piece of DNA that we call as a genome, the entire content in the, in, in the cell, the DNA content in the cell. From DNA, we go to RNA, from RNA to protein. So if you call DNA as the molecule which perpetuates life, or which takes us from generation to generation, it is a protein which makes us, which sustains life, which makes us survive on a day-to-day -day basis. So there, there are several thousands of them, and it's estimated that there are 20,000 proteins in, inside our body. At sometimes you know, the estimates vary a lot, from 20,000 to 60,000, with various possible alternate splicings, etc. Leave that aside. So these proteins seem to be doing the job of making us live every day on a day-to-day -day basis. And how does this happen? And what is the problem then? that if it is all understood, where is a drug molecule coming in? If the, the DNA is uncontrolled, uncontrollable expression of the DNA leads to, let's say, cancer, 
then you make a molecule which will stop it. And typically what is done inside the body is a protein which does the job of regulating the DNA expression. So if the protein is not doing its job properly, then the DNA continues to get expressed and cell proliferation takes place. Then what do you need to do for a drug design? Well, you have to make that little molecule and, and probably tinker with that protein, either activate it or inhibit it and so on. That was the idea. Alternatively, you attack the DNA itself. And so how does the DNA talk? Watson and Crick told us in 1950s that DNA is made of four letters, A, T, G, C, that these are some chemical molecules, and then they're all written down here on, in terms of a double helical strand, etc. they base pair. So this was 1950s work. So and now we seem to know how do you make this DNA molecule. If I gave you one strand, A, T, G, C, you will immediately put what is the opposite strand, and you can make a double helix, you can construct the whole molecule, the 3D structure, and so forth. Now, what about the protein? Well, again, Hargob and Corona and others suggested that in 1960s, this was done, that three letters of the DNA will, cons will correspond to one amino acid. So if there is a sequence of DNA bases, you will have a sequence of amino acids you know, going along together with it. You can construct a, what that's called a gene coding for a protein. So now what about the problem of this protein? Here, I'll take just one minute so to emphasize this point that if you have four bases, three used at time, you have 64 possibilities. But we don't have 64 amino acids, we have only 20 amino acids. So there was a, a big debate in the literature on how there are only 20 amino acids when there is a possibility for 64 and so on. Then what someone suggested, in fact Francis Crick himself, that the third base is unimportant. If it's unimportant, then you would only have 16, four square, not four cube. Then why this intermediate number 20, sometimes it wobbles and sometimes it doesn't wobble. Well, I tell the students that you know, this is a classic textbook case where we believe it. We take this truth as biblical and we don't even question. This is where I think we are stuck with this concept of respect. We respect too much the existing knowledge in the textbook so we don't make a barrier. If, if you have to now go beyond it, you have to say, there's got to be a reason for this amino acids to be 20 in number. Is there a reason? Well, none of the textbooks give you a very simplistic answer as to what it could be. I'll, I were to suggest let us say whatever G does, T does just the opposite. Whatever A does, C does just the opposite. Meaning if G, G, etc. codes for one amino acid, T, T will not code for one, it will code for more than one. You will find this whole genetic code can be explained using the simple conjugate rule without exception. And here I assign some plus one and minus one. Now, for those of you who are good with this mathematics, you can just sit down with a piece of paper and then say, well, I want to detect all the protein coding regions in a genome. All I would ask is just sit down, add up all the plus one, minus one values for a given codon, a three-letter code, just keep on, take a walk along the genome, accumulating on your calculator these pluses and minus. You'll be surprised. Whatever codes for a protein has a positive value, whatever doesn't code for a protein has a negative value. Very interesting, not there in the textbooks, but it's something that you can do and start digging in. Why is this so? It's very fascinating. So DNA wants to talk. We probably have to capture that language. Baxter and Crick have done the first job. Now the rest of it is still to be done. Now moving on, now on the protein, this is considered a holy grail of molecular biology, a grand challenge. 60 years, nobody solved the problem. How does a protein take that unique three-dimensional shape which is responsible for the function, which is responsible for the survival of the organism? That's amazing that a problem can remain unsolved for 60 years. With the best of the brains you know, from across the globe working on this, something must be wrong. I suggest we probably are not looking at it right. That's where I title my talk as, how do proteins talk? Do we know the answer? Well, if you go on to the next one, this is what this protein folding problem is. A couple of years ago, this was awarded the Nobel Prize. There is a transcriptional machinery, Venki Ramakrishnan, uh, Tom Stites, and Ada Yonad got the Nobel for coming up with a 3D structure of the ribosomal machinery, which produces these proteins. A polypeptide amino acids come together, polypeptide chain is formed, and eventually takes a 3D shape. Now, what is this 3D shape due to? And now you can ask this question. I don't care about this protein folding problem. Why do I care? But unfortunately, 90% of the drug targets are proteins. If you knew the 3D structure, it's like knowing the shape of the lock. If you know the lock and you start determining the keyhole, you can create the key that your drug molecule, which can jam the lock, such as an inhibitor, or you can open the lock which are like an activator. So the drug molecule does just that job, and 90% of our drug targets are proteins. So we need to know the shape of the lock, and therefore we want to solve it. Pharma is just one 
customer of this protein folding. There are so many other areas where protein folding has its ramifications. Now, moving on to this, are we looking at it right? Now, here, of course, I've just li listed all the various properties of proteins, structural proteins, contractile toxins, hormones. Those are the various things that they're doing inside our body. And they are made of 20 letters, as opposed to the DNA, which is made of four letters. And these 20 letters have small ones, big ones, you know, phenyl rings, aromatic. This is like basic high school level chemistry, about 20 different letters. Now, what is it that we don't know about these proteins that we are unable to predict the 3D structure? So one observation that came up recently is that if you want to sustain the life form, somehow these amino acids, these 20 amino acids are put together on a polypeptide chain in a fixed ratio. I'm giving you some plus, minus, etc. that's a standard deviation of occurrence of these amino acids. Believe me, take any organism. I'm examining about 130,000 here, so 131,000 sequences of proteins from various organisms, and they all seem to have a very tight margin. I call this as a margin of life. And if you deviate a lot from this, the life form disappears. So there seems to be a fixed stoichiometry in which all these amino acids occur. That's one interesting observation. The second one is that given this, this polypeptide chain and these 3D structures are forming, the amino acids are talking to each other. What is the language that they're doing, that they're using to talk to each other so that they take a 3D shape? You can see three different shapes on the right hand side. One of them happens to be a subunit of hemoglobin, which is responsible for oxygen capture, etc. And then there is albumin, third is an isomerase, and so forth. So same amino acids, but used in different compositions in different sequence, give you a different shape. And the shape is responsible for its function. Now, moving on to the next one. About the DNA, Watson and Crick told us a long time ago that if you have ATGC pairing, it's all that's required. You can create a DNA. And those of you who want to do drug design can take that piece of DNA on the computer, do F equals to MA, solve Newton's equations, do a molecular dynamic simulation, put a drug molecule, make sure it binds tightly to the exact place. What about the proteins? I give you a sequence. You, we do not know the three structure. So the conventional classification of these amino acids is that they're aliphatic, hydro, this is a typical chemistry language, hydroxyl, aromatic, etc. It has not done it. 60 years, we have not progressed. Something must be wrong. Maybe we just discard this idea. I, this is where I'm telling you, this concept of respect has really been very bothersome. This is one of the most stumbling, major stumbling blocks in the progress of our knowledge in the area of biochemistry. And I, I keep telling my, my students that, well, particularly in this country, we respect our parents, we respect our teachers, so you get a bad grade if you don't respect them. I said, you place respect with love, then you have the liberty to disagree. And that will enable you to push your frontiers of knowledge a little farther. So that's the expectation here. Now I were to say that when I examine about 3,000 crystal structures, I don't find that they are going to be very different. All the amino acids seem to to have similar neighborhoods. I show this more graphically on this. They all seem to have same neighborhoods, meaning what is going on in this protein? How do these guys talk to each other? So here I give you a simple math example. Some of you probably are good. Again, high school level mathematics. If I were to have a triangle and color three sides as red color, and you just turn away and I rotate the triangle by 120 degrees, and you come back and see, well, you wouldn't take, make any difference. You wouldn't see any difference. That's because of this rotation symmetry, symmetries of the triangle. If I flip it by 180 degrees, you wouldn't see a difference. If I rotate it by 120 degrees, you don't see a difference. Let us say you take four colors on the triangle on each edge of the triangle, and then how many triangles can you make? You can make 64, just like our 64 codons. Now, quite surprisingly, you can make only 20 unique color triangles from this because of the triangular symmetry. I've listed them as 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way to the 20. One side is red, the other side is red, third side is red, so that's one kind of a triangle, etc. Then you ask this question, how many times does the red appear in these 20 triangles? Well, I'm giving you as a property one, it appears 10 times. Similarly, blue appears, this is simple mathematics, nothing complicated. Blue also appears in 10 triangles, so also purple as well as green. And how many times red and blue occur together? Well, they occur only four times. This is straightforward mathematics. I'm sure we can all work it out. Now you might say, what has this got to do with proteins? Now, quite surprisingly, there is, there is this analogy of 20 unique triangles versus 20 amino acids. You might say this is a crazy coincidence. You know, we see a lot of coincidences, but it doesn't mean you have to have a mathematical uh, underlying foundation for such an observation. But let's just take one step ahead. What are these properties? Let's postulate this in terms of rules for the amino acids. What we are proposing 
that there's got to be amino acids like chains have evolved based on four properties, just like our four colors. Right? And then a minimum of one and a maximum of three properties are used to specify each amino acid. Let's propose. We could be wrong, nothing wrong in being wrong. But if you do discover something interesting, then you probably will help humanity in getting the 3D structure of the protein and probably take the world forward. The second is each property occurs on only 10 amino acids, just like the red color, et cetera. And then any two properties occur simultaneously in only four and so forth. So you, you postulate these ideas. Now you start scratching your brain as to what is this? What are these various properties? Does anything like this occur? This is where your high school chemistry will probably help you. And uh, you will find that there are a couple of sp3 hybrid hydrogen bond donating ability and uh, absence of a carbon delta carbon and uh, similarly absence of branching these seem to be some interesting properties then you would say well this is a coincidence it, does it really occur then you start looking at the table in a great detail with the properties that are listed which are very different from the conventional classifications that you see that if there is a hydrogen bond donor how many times does it occur it occurs only 10 times sp3 gamma carbon only 10 times absence of delta carbon only 10 times, just like the, the triangle that you looked at. And if you start seeing a mathematical correlation like that beyond 1, 2, 3, 4, then you start to say, well, something must be here in this, this whole theory of these proteins. But we have never looked at amino acids like this in this particular manner. So what I just mentioned to you is that there is a need to look at amino acids and the constituents of proteins differently. It's, it's badly required. For, this, for the sake of humanity, please do something about it. And make sure that you see these amino acids. Stop. You know, all this the reading from the biochemistry textbooks, they have done a good job so far in taking us this far. But now time has come with regard to protein folding in particular. Uh, and the, the, not just protein folding, protein DNA recognition, which is responsible for the expression of the genome, protein RNA, protein protein interactions, protein drug discovery, all of them are built into it. That's, and if you are able to say something about recognition, fantastic, nothing like it. We seem to know all about Bollywood love. We don't seem to know anything about molecular love. So that's the message here and uh, something that you can contribute. So this is not to say that world has stopped and we are not doing any drug discovery, etc. That is going on. In fact, we have automated now the whole process of genome all the way to heat molecule. I leave it at heat molecule. The day we are convert this heat to like a magic bullet and goes to the exact target and binds there, maybe with the help of a robotic system, there you have a drug molecule. It's still that point of time, it could just, the heat molecule can cause all kinds of toxicity, side effects, etc. But then if it's a magic bullet to the target, then you have a drug molecule. Thanks again, and uh, I hope you'll continue to work on some of the ideas that I presented and probably take us all forward for a better tomorrow. Thank you.